I hope everybody had a less than hectic time coming here, driving here, or flying. Ted Fellows made my week just a few minutes ago. He, he came up to me and he says, Ray, I, I need your help. I said, what do you mean? You look, why don't you ask my wife? That's where everybody, people talk, talk to Debbie. She knows everything. He said, no, you're the only one that can help me with this. I go, what's that? He said, well, I left my sports coat at home. I think it was the same size, so I needed a sports jacket. So thanks, Ted. We didn't have to ask my wife. My topic today is Jesus Christ was a dispensationalist. If you would, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. I'm sure most of you know that verse by memory, which says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of fellowship once again in your word. I just pray that all the words glorify you and redound to your glory. Amen. Turn on the lavalier, Ray. Is that better now? Thanks, Lou. Jesus Christ was a dispensationalist. A dispensation, it's the Greek word oikonomia. It means management of a household or stewardship of a household. The word steward is used three times in the Bible. And the word dispensation is also the same word it's used four times in the Bible. The Bibles, the newer Bibles are, well, let me put it to the issue. People hate dispensationalism so much that they've added a couple of words to describe it. And they say, are you a hyper-dispensationalist or, a, or an ultra-dispensationalist? Well, a hyper, the word hyper is a word-forming element, meaning over, above, beyond, exceeding, in excess. The word ultra it's extremist, fanatical, rabid. Am I preaching to a bunch of rabid people? I don't think so. I've learned something in the time I've been in ministry. If somebody talks to you and says, are you a hyper or ultra dispensationalist? Do you know the best way to answer this? Well, first of all, those two words aren't in the Bible, but why don't you tell me what you think I believe and let me respond to that. It has saved me countless time. And one guy from Alabama, he's in the second or third year of the school because of that. Because other people will put things in the, into their people's minds about dispensationalism is a cult. It's taboo. Yet when people understand what's going on in the Bible, it's like a light bulb going on in, in, their, in their brain, and it becomes a brand new book, even if they studied the book their whole life. And it becomes fascinating. It becomes part of themselves. They become one with the book. How can you be too extreme with the Bible? Can you be too extreme if you memorize too many verses? Wasn't Jesus Christ's death extreme? Didn't they have to invent the word to describe the pain he went through? Excruciating out of the cross? Synonyms for that pain was unbearable, unendurable, agonizing, racking pain. Somebody, I was talking to somebody this morning here, and um, they're going, I guess, to a messianic assembly that supposedly believe in Jesus Christ, but they're not treating him too well. They're throwing out the blood and this and that, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's just, I don't understand it. I do. But you've heard this phrase before, to be scriptural but not dispensational is the most dangerous doctrine in the world. You heard Rusk quoting 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, where people are going to rest under their own destruction. That means if some people die and they open their eyes, they're on their way to hell. They'll be quoting scripture on the way to hell, but it's the wrong scripture because they think they can lose their salvation. They don't know that they're secure in Christ. They don't understand that, the security. And we do. The only kind of peace that we can have today 
is internal peace. That's it. The best you can hope for is that you don't have too much pain when you die. There was a, a woman that just died in my assembly. And so I'm playing hooky from South Bend, my church in South Bend, by the way. And, but she just died recently. And uh, one of her last requests was because all four of her children, they, they're not saved. I, I want my children to know where I'm going. So I went up to one of the children, and I tried talking to him. He didn't want to hear it, so I backed off. But then I finally went up to him. I said, now listen, this was your mother's last request. You're not going to be here for the memorial service. We're going to make a CD of it. Is it okay if we mail it to you guys? Okay, it's okay. But the, that's the last thing she wanted them to know. If you get saved, you're going to meet her again. If you don't, you, you won't. If you go to Luke chapter 4, mother context verse here, Luke chapter 4, Jesus Christ was a dispensationalist, and we all know these verses. This is during the earthly ministry of Christ. And this is his first recorded sermon. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Now I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 61. Where he quoted this from. There was a, an additional, additional words to that verse. But he closed the book. He immediately began to make his beloved nation know where they stood in the program of God. Here I am, the fulfillment of the Old Testament. I've come here doing miracles. And here's the point. At, you're right at the program of God. We're right here, right now. I'm here to get you, Israel, the commonwealth, to believe that I'm your Messiah. Is there any trouble in understanding that so far? Okay. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison, to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all, more, all that more. Now, did he quote the last part of that verse? He closed the book. Jesus Christ was rightly dividing the word of truth. The time of vengeance for Israel was not yet. Well, it's going to come in the future, but he, he came there to offer that nation salvation. Souls, they, they needed salvation for, for their soul. They wanted physical salvation because of the trouble they've been in with the Gentiles all their lives. So he said this to his detractor, detractors. The same people who bribed the guards who were guarding the tomb of Jesus, money, saying, tell the people that his apostles came in and stole me out, took me out of here. The Roman soldiers said, we can't do that because if we didn't guard our post, the punishment is death for us. So they told them, we'll cover that for you too. And they gave them large money. And as the verse says in Matthew 28, the same thing is still being told to the Jews today. The Pharisees, the priests, the Sadducees became jealous of the Lord Jesus Christ. They saw the miracles that he did. They could not deny them. And they were concerned about their position with the people. When you, when you preach the gospel to somebody, when you, when you try to explain how God's working today, that salvation is a free gift, we're living in a time period called the dispensation of the grace of God. And we've been in this time period, according to the Bible now, our final authority, Russ did a great job on that, for almost 2,000 years. If they start getting angry at you, 
you've hit pay dirt. You know you're tell, telling them the right thing because that's the reaction of most other Christians, sorry to say. Now, recently at our church, there was a, about two weeks ago, we had a fellow from Kenya, eastern Kenya, come there. And he was with his family, his wife and, and three children. And why was he at, at, at our assembly? Well, he lived across the street from a, a woman that comes there, and she said to me one time, let's get him in here. Maybe, you know, let him hear, let's hear what he has to say. Can, he can make his presentation, and, all, and maybe we can teach him something. Or maybe we can't. I don't know. Anyway, he got up, took almost the entire time period, and right away he went to Matthew 28. This is, I want to preach the gospel of the kingdom. You were there, Barb, right? And he went through, he had his slides and the projector and all that. We don't have that, you know. And, and he's showing these pictures. And, and, and he said, I, I wanted to come back here to get my master's in theology. So he went to, I think it's Jerry Falwell, Liberty University. And he's showing these slides. And then, and then he starts showing these slides of people in Kenya. And then, then he's got this chart. It's, it's a big pie, big round circle. He's got a little sliver saying 20%. And the rest is 80%. Now, he said, that 20% is the money that I have now, but I need 80% to do what I want to do if I go back to Kenya. So I thought, wait a minute, now, you've been here 11 years, and have you saved any money to do that? So he, there was no numbers. Just, I need this money. He said, I need money to, to, to get a house. I need money to educate my children over there because you have to pay for that. And I also need money for the ministry. Well, it dawned on me very quickly that, this guy's master is in how to raise money, because that was his focus. He read something out of Exodus, which was completely out of, I don't know why he read that. And you got to realize, most of the people in the, in the assembly, in my assembly, they didn't know he was going to come. Excuse me. So they're wondering why this guy is there. Yeah, I like to give surprises now and then. <laughs> so it took about 40 minutes, and I only had five minutes to get up there. And as God is my witness, I was nice to the guy. Okay? I didn't yell at him. I got up there, and I said, you know, thank you for presenting the material. And I said, do you know what the Matthew 28, Matthew 28 is all about, the Great Commission? He was going out and preaching the gospel of Christ. I says, well, if you read a little closely there, a little closer, talking about them to keep the law, it's a millennial kingdom. It's, there's a five phases of that commission, and this is the last one when Israel is in the millennium, when they're, after they're purged and they're ruling with a rod of iron and getting the other nations to keeping them under the law and telling them about Jesus Christ. He's looking at me like this. So I said to him, calmly. I said, what's the gospel that saves today? Now, I want you to go to Mark chapter 1. He said, the gospel of Christ. Okay? Do you mean to say that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins? He was buried and rose again the third day? Yep, that's what I mean. Okay. So I said to him, go to Mark chapter 1. And let's read a couple of verses. Verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now look at this next verse. Think of just what Russ just preached. As it is written... In the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy faith, which shall prepare the, thy way before thee, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Did it just say the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is this the same gospel we preach back here? Did the 12 apostles know about the grace of God? and the free gift of salvation. 
Were they preaching the gospel? Was it about Jesus Christ? Was it about the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Yet they were still preaching the gospel. The gospel that we preach is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since before the world began. That was given to and through the Apostle Paul. That's what my Bible says. I can show you the words. Be happy to any time, any place. Calmly. <laughs> if I can manage that, I get excited. I know I'm a, I'm a Titus. I understand that. So I, I did something it, to him that I do with a lot of people, except that I raised up the ante. I said, I will give you $10,000, because he needed money, right? <laughs> if you can show me the gospel that saves anywhere, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or early Acts. But I said it calmly. Okay. He's looking at me. And that was about the end of it. So to show good faith, we even took up a collection for him. So guess what happened to me three days later? I received an email from him. He wasn't a very happy camper. He chastised me saying, it's not right to make bets with the word of God. I said, I wasn't making a bet. I was a ch it was a challenge, and you didn't meet the challenge, did you? He never did. I said, remember when you told me you preached the gospel of Christ for salvation? In this, in this email back to him. I said, that's why there are three interdispensational gospels that work in either dispensation. Gospel of peace, gospel of God, and gospel of Christ. And I know that because I can read Mark 1.1. 1, 1. I know Mark 1.1, 1, 1, gospel of Christ, is not the same one Paul's preaching because Paul received further revelation from the ascended Lord. And if you want to deny that, you are not a Bible believer, period. I'm going to stay calm. I get worked up just thinking about it. And no, Ron, I'm not going to have a heart attack. So from Malachi 3 and Isaiah 40, he quoted these verses. Go to, uh, go to Galatians chapter, chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Let's read verses 10 through 12. Galatians 3.10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Can the law save you? It says the law is a curse. Can the law make you happy? No, it says the law works wrath. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You want to put somebody under, under sin again? Bring them back to the law, which is what the book of Galatians is all about. Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? This is what religion does. This is what non-dispensational Bible study does. He's going to go back to Kenya, and he's going to confuse people by saying Matthew 28 is what we have to do today. By the way, the Great Commission, it's, it never says it. I think I looked up, and, I, and it could have been introduced maybe as, six, as early as 1650, but most likely in the early uh, mid-1800s, just that phrase, the gospel of the kingdom, you know, the, you know, the Great Commission, to raise money. For the people to go do what they want, to make people feel guilty. And on his presentation, I see these slides about people in bad conditions. Okay, I feel for that, but you have the wrong gospel. You didn't take the challenge. I challenged you. And if you could have proved me wrong, I would give you $10,000. Don't you need money for your ministry, for your education, for your house, for your children? Yeah. Let me just read you Luke 21, 22. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written by me may be fulfilled. Now that's a little later than Luke 4. This is in Luke chapter 21. 
Because Israel, the, the, the religionists, they didn't listen to the Lord. They, they, they killed them. So, a dispensationalist is somebody who rightly divides the word of truth. The word of truth is the totality of the Bible, Genesis through Revelation. The dispensation, the word is used four times. Let's, let's go there, Ephesians chapter 1. See how it's used. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll go all four times. And look at verse 10. Ephesians 1, 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Does the second part of that verse remind you of a verse in the Bible? Like Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's talking about that, right? Turn to um, Ephesians chapter 3. Russ was here. Ephesians chapter 3. Let me just read you from, starting from verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me to your word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote of four and few words. Did Peter write this, or was it Paul? Thank you. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and as, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me, whom less than the least of all saints is his grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. There is God's will for everybody today. He wants all men to be saved. He wants to make all people see the fellowship of the mystery. That's God's will for everybody. You don't have to find it yourself. It's right there in Scripture. You don't have to wonder about it. Now, go to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, from here. Paul says in verse 25, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. That's the verse you use to prove that, one of the verses, that Paul was given God's completed revelation. Not when he was out here on the earth, but when he went back to heaven. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 9, let me start at verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. If God committed unto you, a dispensation of the gospel, to dispense, what would you do? If God did this to you, you would begin to dispense grace, would you not? Paul didn't do any different. He did not do any different. What is so offensive to other Christians by us preaching this? What is so offensive that we Highlight the Apostle Paul. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'll show you what's offensive, but it shouldn't be offensive because hopefully they have a Bible that they can read it in too. In Romans eleven thirteen, 13, it talks about Paul. He's the apostle to the Gentiles, and he magnifies his office. He says, other places, if you follow me, you're following Christ. Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ. Now, we don't worship Paul. We follow him. But the word magnify, it's the same word as ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, 
1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says we've been entrusted with something. It's our trust too. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer, that's the same word as magnify, by the way, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptations, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Didn't Peter say something about the long suffering of Paul in first, 2 Peter 3.15? Sure he did. He's acknowledging Paul's, Paul's apostleship. Galatians talks about the Peter, James, and John who seem to be pillars. They're no longer the pillars anymore. It seemed to be. Paul had to publicly rebuke Peter in Galatians 2 because he wasn't being true to the current dispensation. A public sin, a public rebuke. Let me tell you what the Bible says if you don't rightly divide the word of truth. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you, are, you will leaven God's message. Invariably, you will mix law with grace, possibly without even understanding that. Or you're going to spiritualize the nation of Israel or say that the church has taken over, we're the spiritual Israel now. That's the most popular. Is that true? Romans chapter 11. Now, when people say that, they really don't understand what they're saying. They're, they're, they're negating many words and promises by God. This man, in the last part of his email to me, he said, I am a dispensationalist. And I'm going to preach the Matthew 28 commission. Well, if you can read the verse, I think it's verse 16 or 17, you're going to put people back under the law. If you understand what's going on in that commission, it's Israel and the millennial kingdom. They're going to be the head again, not the tail. And they're going to be ruling with a rod of iron. Is that what you want your people to understand? Romans 11, 26. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. Case done. It's over. It's written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them which I, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Beloved means just what it means. He loves his nation. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, let me give you a couple other points. You will completely miss the fact that there is more than one gospel taught in the Bible. The two main gospels in the Bible are not the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. Those are the two main gospels in the Bible. And when somebody tells you that the gospel of Christ is not interdispensational. Can you read Mark 1? I can read Mark 1. It is. And this guy thinks he's preaching the gospel of Christ, but he doesn't. He preaches, I think the man was saved. He believes in the blood. But he brings you back to Mark or Matthew, some back there, and, and it's not going to work. Somewhere along the line, you're going to trip and you're going to hurt other people. Now, is that what you want in your conscience at, at the end of your time? I don't want that. People who don't rightly divide the word of truth, they completely miss the fact that there's more than one church taught in the Bible. They completely miss the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and they stay totally ignorant of exactly when God's free gift of salvation to all and upon all that believe enters into Scripture. And when you show them, boy, do they get mad. Unreal. And then they disparage us with a lot of words, and they might even use a verse now and then, but mostly words. That's why Galatians says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Let me give you a couple of examples of people who 
who have disparaged me. Dispensationalism was destructive to my ability to grasp the unity and significance of the biblical story. For instance, when I was a dispensationalist, the Davidic covenant was of almost no importance whatsoever to me. Is that true to us? Do we study that? Of course we do. It's part of the Bible. We rightly divide the word of truth. When I forsook dispensationalism, I was shocked at how central that covenant was, particularly among the writing prophets and advancing the eternal kingdom of God, and I was much better equipped to make sense of Acts 2 and Christ reigning from the throne of David in the New Testament. He thinks the church began in Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, you're still on Old Testament ground. There's nothing about Gentiles there. And he he's, he's, thinks we're spiritual Israel. He thinks he's going to spend his time on earth instead of being, if, if he's saved at all. I don't know. He said the stories of the Old Testament becomes, become Esau's fables. This is a supposed Bible believer. Now, the next couple ones, keep your ears peeled. And I want you to go to 1 John chapter 5, please, because I'm going to use some multi-syllable words. Okay? 1 <laughs> John chapter 5. Dispensationalism, here's the next point, in destroying the unity of God's redemptive purpose in the church, minimizes the singular, all-encompassing headship of Christ. Are you kidding me? When's the last time you read Colossians 1 and 2? When's the last time you read Romans through Philemon? Are you missing? Now these, I'm telling you. Another one. Dispensationalism tends towards a real ethnocentrism. I told you a lot of syllables. As regards Israel, which springs from a veiled materialism. Do you know what ethnocentrism is? It's the belief of the superiority in one's own ethnic group. By the way, this man is a Calvinist. Calvinists believe that God did not die for everybody. Talk, talk about feeling superior, that he only died for some. In other words, all doesn't mean all, right? Final one here. In summary, dispensationalism tends to downplay the Christocentric nature of all reality. Now, I do have a college degree, but these all-encompassing ethnocentrism, materialism, Christocentric, that's kind of confusing to me. Those words aren't in the Bible. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The eternal destiny of all mankind will be determined by these 19 one-syllable words. <laughs> Period. Is Israel the lawful captive of Satan? Because of their transgressions. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? Isaiah says. If you were to read Luke's parable, uh, in Luke chapter 16, the parable of the unjust steward, he wasn't taking care of the household too well, his master's household. He was not being a good steward. And he devised a plan that, because he says, you know, I can't do this menial labor. I can't do that, to steal some money from the steward. Psalm 112 says, a good man will guide his affairs with discretion. What God wants from us, as, as I understand it, or as my, I like to say my current level of understanding, you know, leaving open. I could be wrong somewhere down the road about salvation. I know I'm not. But as I understand it, the, the, a parable is a figure of speech in which a story from real life is used to illustrate some higher truth. And in Luke 16, in that parable, it's clearly spoken to the, to the priest of Jesus Christ's time. Let me ask you a couple questions here. How many Christians today know that Israel became the lawful captive of Satan. Have you talked to many Christians that know that? Whether to even bring up that topic? How many Christians today 
would have enough knowledge to show you the reasons why Israel fell nationally. How many Christians today would know where to find the beginning of the times of the Gentiles in the Old Testament? These are questions, are basic questions for us, right? This is foundational doctrine. But how many Christians out there, if you ask them this question, would they jump for joy? Yeah, I know the answer. Or they get mad at you. Of course, you'd have to respond calmly like I do. <laughs> how many Christians today could show you exactly where in the Bible the spiritual fall of that nation took place? Acts chapter 7. By the way, the other one was when Nebuchadnezzar took over the south. How many Christians today have enough knowledge to explain the reasons why? Don't we study about these things? Don't we study the whole Bible? Can't we stand there, maybe not memorize the verse, but can't we show them where to go to find out this information? Don't we believe the context and not just the verses out of context? I mean, come on. What's happened to Christianity? But the limp-wristed, pennyways, blame-shifting, it's just unreal. Grow up here. How many Christians today could scripturally show and explain the reason for Paul's salvation and conversion? Again, these questions, everybody here knows that. But it seems like 99% of the people out there don't know this. And I think of that verse in Timothy, all those in Asia be turned away from me. Well, the people are turning away from us too. It's, there's nothing new under the sun. So don't get discouraged, is my point. There are so many Old Testament verses which speaks at length about the land God gave Israel with specific borders. Why would God be so specific about the land if natural Israel were never to possess it? at least in the dimensions given in the word. Why would, well, you know, they have never fully possessed it yet. And according to non-dispensationalists, they never will. But I just read you that verse in Romans chapter 11, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. In Ezekiel 40 through 48, in these chapters, was there a need to be so specific and detailed about the layout of the temple if all of this was figurative? And not literal. Is this just waste of space in sacred scripture? When someone asks a question, several assumptions may be contained, which can either be false or true. If I asked Alice Kurz over there, Alex, have you stopped beating your wife? <laughs> if he said yes, well, that would imply that he did beat her. And if he said no, that means he, he, he did beat her, but he, but he stopped. Or whatever, you know, you know what I'm saying here. I didn't stop beating her. To answer the question correctly, Alex would have, need to correct the false assumptions contained in the question. Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter 1. People bait you with questions. And when they bait you, it's our job to be, to understand what's going on. And the only way you can do that is if you rightly divide the word of truth. Because you know when you're being baited, you know when you're being lied to, you know when you're being schmoozed. Now I say this because in this passage I'm going to read, several assumptions are contained in the question given to Jesus Christ. And as I understand the passage, Jesus never challenges the assumption. Acts chapter 1 verse Verse 6 through 8. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come unto you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in all Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, there's four assumptions in verse 6. 
which again were never challenged by Jesus Christ. Number one, Israel once had the kingdom. Okay? Number two, Israel lost the kingdom. Right? Number three, Jesus Christ has the power to restore the kingdom back to Israel. They had a literal, physical, visible, earthly Davidic kingdom. He had a Davidic covenant, right? Number four, there's a fixed time when this will be accomplished. Now I'm going to do something a little unusual here in just a minute. I'm going to sing a little song. Now, I haven't sung in a long time, so don't grade me on that, but sometimes it's better to sing it than, than to say it. But have all of you seen these domino chain things where people with a, you know, a patient person and a steady hand sets up these dominoes and it causes a chain reaction like that? It's pretty nice to watch, isn't it? If a person does not study and believe the Bible dispensationally, certain scriptural things are guaranteed. You will have, at some point leaven the gospel. It's absolutely guaranteed. Absolutely. You will mix in the law Promote personal work to stay saved or whatever, and you will most definitely confuse people. And that's the last thing you want to do. Ultimately, you will take the focus off both the love and faith of Christ and put it on yourself. Here, I need money to build a house. I need money to educate my kids. I need money for the ministry. Give it to me. I'm working for God. Well, did Paul ask for money? Who's our pattern today? Paul was a what? A tent maker. That's our pattern. We work for a living. Now, before I sing this song, I've got to give you a little bit of my background. I'm more than half Irish. Okay? Irish Catholic. Uh, Italian Catholic, Irish Catholic, they, they both go together. I think the difference is maybe... Two years of high school. I don't want to say which one. <laughs> now, my great-grandmother on my mother's side, her name was Dora Doyle. I have a third cousin by the name of Terrence Doyle who did our genealogy. Then had a bunch of other cousins. Their last name was Dorothy. And one of them married a man from Ireland who spent time in jail because he was part of the Irish Republican Army. His name was O'Hagan. Then my grandmother on my father's side. Her maiden name was Mary Catherine Bellahy. And her people come from Southern Ireland, County Tipperary. So that's some of my background. When you think of the Irish, what comes to mind? <laughs> Nothing? Can we say maybe hot tempered? <laughs> uh, yeah, emotional, you know. I mean, some of the, you know, fighting Irish, the luck of the Irish, you know. Lucky charms, I, I know. <laughs> Green, four leaf clovers, marshmallows. <laughs> An Irish marshmallow? <laughs> I don't remember that. I had a cousin some years ago get married. It was a real Irish Catholic wedding. You know, when you go to an Irish Catholic wedding, there's a whole lot of drinking going on. And at the reception, I think his name was Father O'Malley. He wanted to make a statement to all the married men. He says, all right, now, ladies, now listen up. I'd like to see every one of you sinned by the one person who's made your life worth living. The bartender was almost crushed to death. We seem to have a fatal attraction to the liquid. Now, I say this because there are some situations in which the Irish are not the sharpest tool in the shed. And I think it's very profitable to maintain a sense of humor about yourself. Emotional, quick-tempered, what? All these things. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to sing you sing a little song. It's called... Sick note. It was done by people from Dublin, Ireland called the Dubliners. And again, don't grab me on my voice, but I just want you to show you because think of that domino chain reaction again. What happens to people who don't rightly divide the word truth? Here we go. Dear sir, I write this note to you to tell you of me plight 
And at the time of writing, I am not a pretty sight. Me body is all black and blue, me face a deathly gray. And I write this note to say why Patty's not at work today. While working on the 14th floor, some bricks I had to clear. Not to throw them down from such a height, it was not a good idea. The foreman wasn't very pleased, he being an awkward sod. He'd said I'd have to cart them down, the ladders in me hide. Now, clearing all these bricks by hand, it was so very slow. So I hoisted up a barrel and secured the rope below. But in me haste to do the job, I was too blind to see that a barrel full of building bricks was heavier than me. <laughs> so when I untied the rope, the barrel fell like lead. In clinging tightly to the rope, I started up instead. Well, I shot up like a rocket, till to my dismay I found that halfway up, I met the bloody barrel coming down. <laughs> well, the barrel broke me shoulder as to the ground it sped. And when I reached the top, I banged the pulley with me head. Well, I clung on tight on the mud shock from this almighty blow. And the barrel spilled off half the bricks, 14 floors below. Now, when these bricks had fallen from the barrel to the floor, I then outweighed the barrel and so started down once more. Still clinging tightly to the rope, I sped towards the ground. And I landed on the broken bricks that were all scattered round. Well, I lay there groaning on the ground. I thought I'd passed the worst. When the barrel hit the pulley wheel, and then the bottom burst. Well, the shower of bricks rained down on me. I hadn't got a hope. As I lay there moaning on the ground, I let go the bloody rope. <laughs> the barrel then being heavier, it started down once more and landed right across me as I lay upon the floor. Well, it broke three ribs and my left arm, and I can only say that I hope you'll understand why Patty's not at work today. <laughs> One more thing. Faith works by love. Not my love, not my faith. Christ's love and Christ's faith. It is in Paul's epistles alone, Romans through Philemon, where we find our doctrine, our duty, our destiny, and our walk. Jesus Christ was a dispensationalist. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for these words, for the for opening up the eyes of our understanding, allowing us to be part of this. Thank you in your son's name. Amen.